I thought maybe I'd just say a little bit about my background if you wanted to do the same. Um, I'm a psychologist. I'm based at Lancaster Univers U University Management School. And I started doing research in the health service. I was reflecting today. It's over 25 years. And, and I got involved in doing research in the health service because I was trying to answer a theoretical question about what led people to innovate at work and uh, was interested in looking at two groups. One was student nurses who seemed to be very proactive young people but placed in uh, back in the mid-80s, an environment where they had little discretion to do things their own way. And also at health visitors, similarly motivated group of people but who had a much more autonomous role. And one thing led to another and I carried on doing research within the health service looking at primary health care teams and um, then looking at all, a, a range of different types of teams before going on to look at how people management in the health services predicted outcomes uh, and most recently a, a three-year study with a, a fantastic team looking at cultures of um, high quality uh, care within NHS England and I have to say that the, the NHS is the most amazing and exciting context that I've worked in in my career uh, and it, ju it feels incredibly important for me personally to make a difference to um, ensure that research helps um, people who work in the health service deliver better quality patient care and fulfill their mission really that they so desperately want to fulfill of providing high quality care. And I know your background has been you know, similarly motivated by desire to make a really positive difference, Mike. I have and um, thank you for that, Michael. It's good to have you on the call. Um, yeah, I, I've been uh, NHS uh, for about 31 years now um, and I like the idea of getting up out of bed every day to try and improve health and save lives and working at the limits of science and human skill and knowledge and at a time when people need us and, and that's the NHS constitution for you. Mm -hmm. um, and I must say, I think reminding people of the purpose of patient-centered care, that's why I've always been a provider side uh, uh, leader. I enjoy the contact I have. Not in child care provides a whole range of services um, nationally, regionally, and locally. And uh, I like working with clinicians to engage service users and patients uh, to make a difference to their lives. And um, I think my research interest probably has been kindled by a few things around you know encouraging my clinicians to use evidence and what works and encourage them to explain that to service users and patients but actually quite often being challenged by them around the leadership research and saying well is what you're suggesting do you think that going to work for us uh, mm -hmm. so knowing the, the the way around the leadership evidence um, and Michael, you've been one of my sort of inspirations around that on team development, on clinical effectiveness, on the quality of appraisal, and, and we've worked together for many years, and uh, uh, I think we all need our inspirations, and uh, I hope people today will get a chance to, you know, think a little bit about the culture of the organizations they're working in, and what they can do about that culture, um, and perhaps we can, you know, kick off with something around that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, from my, my perspective, the most important thing that we can do to deliver high quality care is to create a culture. That, that means to create um, a, a human community where the values of, uh, that are important um, for delivering high quality patient care are lived within the organization. And so creating a culture feels to me the most important issue in the work that we do. Um, and I was going to ask you, Mike, really, what three or four strategies have you most have you found most effective in in shaping you know the culture or, or uh, in terms of your leadership in NHS organisations? Uh, I think um, in culture terms, a lot of people say, "Well, what is culture?" Well, for me, I'm, I'm from Yorkshire. I'm fairly unvarnished on some of my <laughs> definitions, but you know, it's the way we do things round here is the culture of, of, of an organisation. Um, sometimes it's the way we should do things around here when we don't quite get it right and when we're trying to stretch and move the... So defining culture is important, um, that we want it to be open, that we want it to be very patient-focused, that we want to listen to ideas, we want innovation, 
who want to try things uh, and, and have a no-blame culture around being fair and just. Um, so we, we've got quite um, uh, a sense of culture in Knott's Healthcare where we've got, it's called positive, it stands for a range of people, openness, sensitivity, innovation, integrity, a, a range of things. Um, and I think uh, people quite like working within that and, and, and when we get a chance to explain it to patients and service users, they respond well to that and, and, and help add to that culture. Um, mm. I think it's important that we do the whole job, uh, that um, we're patient facing but we do deliver on the money. I think that's quite a hard job for, for, for us all to get across, particularly in the contested uh, nature of the health service political aspirations for the NHS. I like to feel that managers and service users uh, aren't encouraged to walk past the litter, you know, sometimes things aren't right and we need to be able to say when things aren't right. So I, I do encourage people to, um, you know, speak out a little in terms of things that are good and, and recognize good practice, that's really important in, in, in health organizations. Um, I think high performance in health organizations is uh, around a developmental environment, one that's got some challenge but one that has support too and uh, I think you can tell a really good organization by how it treats people who are less fortunate and, and vulnerable individuals and people who are having a tough time and I was reflecting on somebody last week who came to me with a really difficult issue and I suggested she go home um, and she's one of our busiest people who, who always puts water into our lake, you know, is always at the pump doing things mm -hmm. and I told her to go and sit on the bank for the afternoon and just recognize how good the lake was and get on with some things she needed to do in her family to, mm -hmm. to uh, allow her to come back next week and, and do things and they'd actually have been really busy today. I like authentic culture, I like distributed leadership, I think they're really important in the NHS. Can I ask you the same, Michael? What, what do you think? Well, I, 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 for me, there, there are, um, I mean, it is, as you say, it's how we do things around here. And in a sense, culture, it feels like it's the kind of finely textured human weave that makes up an organization, or indeed any sort of human community, whether it's a you know, local neighborhood community or whatever. It's, it's, that, it, it's the way we do things, the way we behave towards each other. And for me, there are some really important things to get right. The first is that it seems to be really important that everybody understands what the vision is of the organization in terms of delivering high quality, compassionate care, and that that's not just what's kind of said in public documents, but that's continually reinforced and, uh, and, and monitored and, and uh, you know, comes alive for the people who work in the organization. Um, and, and second, that it seems to me really important, as you said, that there's a very strong performance focus. And I believe that, for, you know, for me, it's really important that we clarify people's objectives at work. We make sure people are clear about what it is that they're required to do. And, and I do think there's a lot more we need to do in, in health service organizations about making sure that the board is clear about what its priority objectives are, making sure that each department and each directorate, directorate has a statement of their priority objectives. You know, from my perspective, I do ideally no more than six or seven, and that teams have clear objectives because we know that's what predicts team performance, and that individuals everywhere in the organization are clear about what their six or seven priorities are in terms of their work so that the whole organization is focused on uh, uh, on high high performance and then the third is making sure that there's just great people management because one of the most extraordinary discoveries of my research career was first of all in manufacturing organizations finding that the best predictor of productivity and profitability over time was HRM practices, how human resource management practices, how the staff are managed, and then discovering exactly the same finding in, in healthcare that uh, people management was the best predictor we could find of patient mortality in acute hospitals. And then the fourth is really making sure we've got high levels of um, employee engagement, and, and that's about you know making sure that people feel proud of their organizations, making sure they they, they love their work, basically, but most importantly of all, making sure that they feel 
that they are involved in decision making, that they're consulted, that they can contribute to uh, their, their ideas to important decisions about how to deliver care. And fifth is, is teamwork. And one, for me, one of the kind of a, abiding themes of my research career has been to be able to demonstrate how important teamworking is. And we've been doing it for 150,000 years. Uh, the challenge is to do it well in modern organizations. And in the health service, I think we're, we're about 40, 50 percent of the way there, but there's another 40 or 50 percent of the way to go. And then the final bit is, for me, is about having leaders who are driven by a set of values, as you described. You know, it's a, you, you want to go to work and make a difference to help other human beings to, to promote high quality care. You're driven by a set of values which fire you up as a human being and give meaning to your life. And I think we need all of our leaders to really be fired by their values. And it's kind of, for me, something about encouraging leaders to, to connect with their values, understand what their values are, and then to have the courage to live those values through their leadership. And I, you know, those are, for me, some of the key elements in, in weaving this amazing thing that, that we call culture, as you said, the way we do things around here. I love what you said about alignment there, Michael. You know, the being able to align people to the purpose, the vision of the organization, trying to align people to recognize what good looks like and performance, as well as the, the, the human interest side of what we do. You know, if we don't get it right for our people, the service users, the patients, and the staff, the NHS is not going to work. We won't get that discretionary effort out of people, which yeah. you... You, you can't assume, but you can get if you if you get the, the whole culture mm. thing right. Mm. I'd like to pick up on something you said as well about, you know, your your colleagues sending them off to sit by the riverbank for the afternoon. I think we need a whole lot more of that in the NHS. You know, I don't know if you know, but <clears throat> before I, I kind of embarked on work in organizations, my PhD was on the psychology of meditation. This was back in the 1750s or something, but anyway, uh, that's what I did my PhD on. But one of the, one of the, uh, I guess, areas that I've explored over the last 20 years in concert with co with research team colleagues is the importance of what I've called reflexivity of taking time out on a regular basis, um, whether it's teams or individuals or the whole organisation, but taking time out to to step back and reflect on uh, and clarify what is it we're trying to achieve here in our team. I mean, what, what is it that we what's the difference we really want to make and and then to reflect on okay how are we going about it what are we doing as a team are we where are we effective and ineffective and then making changes accordingly and our research shows really clearly that teams that do that are much more productive than teams that don't so it's yeah. it, you know for me one of the things we need to insist on is that teams take time out on a regular basis but I and I think it applies for all of us in our work life as well as is the need to to periodically continually step back and say you know what's important here what's the where, what's the difference I want to make and how can I best make that that difference and the reason I think it's important as well is because I see something of a pathology within NHS organizations that, that goes something like if we work harder and faster in the same way we'll overcome the problems uh, whereas actually I think very often it's about stepping back and redefining and understanding what the problems are. And I guess I wanted to kind of ask you, you a question. I mean, at the minute we've got um, profound changes going on in the NHS, and, and, I, and I wonder, you know, what, what can middle and senior managers do, do you think, to help ensure that the changes following the Health and Social Care Act lead to better health and social care and better staff well-being? I mean, that's a tough question, but it's one that kind of I keep thinking about because we are in the middle of such a lot of change. Hi. Thank you, Michael. I mean, from my point of view, uh, I've got a slide that I'm using on all presentations at the moment. It's sort of basically, it says the NHS is about people, folks. You know, it's a bit like, uh, was it Clinton who said, you know, how do you win an elections, president? Well, it's the economy, stupid. Yeah. In, in the NHS, it's the people, stupid. And uh, mm. what, what patients and service users want is dignity, responsiveness, a sense of control, uh, a sense of choice. They want clean hospitals. They want stuff that works for them, clinically effective care. But they want this dignity, respect, involvement in treatment and care. 
what what staff want is is that job role that job clarity you talked about earlier they want to be in a sense of a real team they want feedback they want chance to develop they want chance to develop in the role and they want chance to develop their careers that sense of control again and i think getting middle and senior managers to understand that and understand how their role can impact on both of those to get better care uh, experience uh, to get better staff well-being is really important so keeping patient focus I started off with the Constitution I really like that piece you know it reminds me of the purpose of what we're about um, I think being mindful something you talk about being a mindful leader is really important at senior and middle management level and all levels um, I like to explain the context of what's happening in the NHS but in doing that, and I work quite hard to do that, to say, well, this is what's coming at us. This is the sort of trends I see ex external in the environment, outside the organization. These are things going on internally within our uh, lovely but large organization, and, and it's quite complex. But I, I'm expecting you to make the right response to that environment, you know, and I'll encourage you and help you to do that. Um, I think it's really important that senior and middle managers and team leaders really explain to staff what's happening you know why is it that we're having to work harder why is it that um, politicians have got their eye on us on quality in light of Francis um, and indeed the public have so explaining to staff explaining why we're doing things as well as what we're trying to do I think staff like that I think again coming back to some of your research Michael great team development really understanding what are the two or three things that teams won't do as well as what they try and do all the time I love that sort of model um, I think having a personal development plan for everybody and having a role managerially to support that to give people that little bit of space that permission to take the team out once every quarter or six months to talk about how they're working not just how hard they're working but talk about how their relationships are how how things are moving um, I think you know listen more talk less um, ask don't tell ask more don't tell as much those are the sorts of tips I'd be giving <laughs> you know uh, and I try and um, I'm not sure I always model them myself but I do try yeah, and I think, as you said, it's, uh, it's about being mindful as a leader, and we're not going to be perfect as leaders, but it's about being mindful about our, the behaviors that are important, and, and uh, not beating ourselves up when we get it, when we, you know, all the time, because we're not doing it perfectly all the time, but celebrating when we get it right. And for me, that piece at the end of what you were saying is really particularly important, is about having conversations as a leader. And I think we need to have many, many more of those throughout the health service because I think what we need is shared definitions of problems from the front line up to the board. And, and that involves listening and inquiring rather than advocating, as you say. And, and for me, the biggest, I think, and most important culture change we need in the NHS is to encourage more conversations so there's more consensus built around what the problems are and therefore uh, you know, more buy-in to what the solutions are. And there's also more innovation, because everybody's ideas are then being contributed to, um, to solving the problems. I see somebody's asked a question about what, what are the biggest um, barriers to developing positive cultures in organizations in the health service. And uh, um, I know I've got a couple of thoughts about that. One is I think that um, we need to um, we need to build the confidence of leaders because I think some of our leaders lack confidence in their leadership and they fall back onto a command and control directive I've got to know all of the answers type of style of management and and you know feel they've got to tell people off rather than uh, do what, what we know is so powerful which is focus on on particularly on, on recognizing people's contributions and good performance and listening to them and involving them in decision making uh, and of course that doesn't doesn't um, uh, negate the fact that if people are behaving badly or performing uh, badly that we need to intervene but actually 95% of our efforts must be focused on encouraging, thanking, recognizing 
Uh, and I think that you know the failure to to do that is is one of the biggest barriers that you know, managers often fail to do that. And, yes, um, yes. And lack confidence. Can I come in on that? I, I think uh, again some nice flow of questions into mm -hmm. approaches and methods to develop reflexivity in groups and teams, and you know how you empower frontline staff from from Tina uh, mm. and, and Sarah respectively. Um, I, I've just we do an Oscars thing. Which is um, it's the tenth year we've done it. Outstanding achievements. It's our internal Oscars, and we had 149 uh, nominations this year for about nine categories. Um, a very authentic occasion where we celebrate people's success and their ideas. Um, you know, and I think that's really important. And it's part of the culture of what we do here. It's part of the lifeblood. Uh, I think. You know, when you first do these things, they can be a little bit false, and, and you have to sort of, you know, um, you know, work the rough edges off them so that people actually believe that this is it's a good thing to do. Some people are uncomfortable in celebrating uh, success in the NHS, and uh, I don't think we should be. We do some fantastic things day in day out. I think the reflexivity comes from that time together, as we both said, the time to be able to sit in a structured way and talk about how people are working and what they're most proud of. I like sessions when we get the team together and say, you know, what we most love about you is when you do that. When you do that, it's great. Uh, to be honest, you know, uh, it'd be good if you did a little less of that because that can create issues. And um, But don't forget what you bring to the team because of ABC. Mm -hmm. That sort of feedback, the regular feedback in in the weave of the team, in the in the sort of discussions that we have, I think it's really important. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that, Mike. I think you know to answer that question of how we empower the front line, it does seem to me that teams are really, really vital in that. That we need to create a, for a forum for teams to share their ideas for new and improved ways of delivering patient care, and we need to ensure that you know when they try to implement the, those ideas they're supported i'll tell you a quick story this was from a company in, in the manufacturing company and uh, i went to see um the production director the first time i visited this company he said oh it's really difficult to get anybody to come up with ideas around here and the next time i went he said he was overwhelmed with innovative ideas and the reason was was because he asked the, the staff on the front line what they'd really like to change and they said well there's all of these filthy materials on the shop floor so he said okay i'll give you a budget you've got you've got six weeks to um, to build an extension to the factory you've got to be in time and in budget they did it in time and way way within budget and then he said they just constantly knocked on his door with new ideas and you know, so there's something about giving people the freedom to take on a, 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 and solve a problem yeah. and then supporting them uh, as, a way of, as a way of embedding that, that culture of, of innovation that makes it clear that we are, we are seeking all of our solutions in a sense, or many of our solutions from the front line. Somebody else has asked a story about, has asked a question about how we measure culture and has mentioned the um, competing values framework which is a an interesting approach that um, uh, examines the extent to which organizations have an internal and or an external focus and how flexible versus how controlling they are. And we just finished an international review of the literature on cultures in healthcare and healthcare performance. And what comes out of that is the one culture which doesn't work internationally in healthcare is command and control, direct, <laughs> directive, internally focused. So. Uh, uh, so, yeah, um, okay. I know I, you go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I'd, um, Pavel, you, you've asked uh, that question, and uh, yeah, I, I think um, how do I uh, measure organizational culture? Um, I, I do believe if you get the culture right, you can deliver anything, the performance, uh, you can ask the organization to do things, and it will do, it will be reflexive with with you as a leader that you'll get the right response. Um, there, are, there are team climate inventories that we've used. Uh, we are actually looking at the competing values framework as we speak. Uh, our executive leadership councils using that. We're using a burnout questionnaire as well. Just uh, we thought we'd done, we've just sent out both of those. Um, I think it is important. I quite like the McKinsey work on uh, 
uh, Colin uh, Price in terms of health and performance, i.e. if you don't continue to have a healthy organisation, you won't continue to perform well. There's some good work in, in that from uh, uh, based in, in Oxford. Uh, so again, there are some good models. I, I think you need to pick a model, have a mental model that works for you, getting an, an organisation to be aligned, to be able to be agile is something I've been working on for quite a while. Um, you can measure bits of it, for example, renewal, something we're working on. It requires innovation, being outward looking and the right sort of leadership to take, you know, give people permission uh, uh, and forgiveness, <laughs> um, that, that type of risk appetite. And uh, uh, I think there is quite a lot of evidence around um, that you, you can measure these things. If you over measure them, you can crush culture, you can, yeah. um, you can get an answer that probably isn't right. And, uh, I think you know, for, for something, it's quite a soft science cultural transformation. You tend to know if it's right, if people are you know, asking you things, if they are telling you things, mm -hmm. um, if they are feeling comfortable themselves and feeling valued in the role. And there's something you know, from my perspective about going into different organizations that from the moment you go in, you're on a discovery of culture. And you, you, you get a sense of the culture very often from, um, from quite early on. Um, and then you build a richer and richer picture. I remember the work that we did in manufacturing organizations. We, we would start to build a picture of the culture from the time we first made contact with the organization in terms of how we were dealt with. You know, on NHS organizations, you get a sense of to what extent there's a culture of compassion. There's also, you know, we've, got, we've already got met some measures that are good proxies in the staff survey, so there's a measure which asks about, you know, would you want your relatives to be treated here? Would you recommend a friend to come and work in this organization? We've also got the measure of engagement in the um, staff survey, but uh, I think it's important to point out that on the measure of engagement, the most important component as a predictor of performance of NHS organizations is the, it, it, are you involved in decision-making component of the staff engagement measure? Kind of in the future, I guess what I'd be interested in is seeing the extent to which people are spending, you know, a, a good part of their time in, in in work in flow. They're really enjoying their jobs. Time is passing quickly. You know, they're not feeling angry or frustrated or anxious. That that there is that sense of contributing, and the extent to which people um, derive a sense of meaning from their work. I mean, my perception is most people who come to work in the, in the NHS do so because they want to give, they want to help other people, that's their, that's their core mission and uh, to the extent that they're able to do that in their work, they get a strong sense of meaningfulness in their lives and we know that you know, it's not pleasure which is most important in terms of co contributing to our sense of happiness, it, it's the sense of meaningfulness in our lives and, and work is, is obviously a hugely important domain within which that can happen. Um, and, I, and I just one quick point to make is that I, I, my sense is, you know, we're, we're talking about lots of elements, and yes, culture is com complicated, um, but it's not that difficult to, to, to get it right. You know, it's, th there are some simple things that we can do in terms of the you know, ideas that you expressed about positivity and clarity of purpose and so on. It's not that difficult, and there are you know, lots of good examples across the NHS. I know one which is in Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust, but you must see some others as well, Mike. <laughs> um, indeed, but, but I think um, one or two other questions come in. One that is just, uh, somebody just wants to ask the question and, uh, and not uh, say who they are, which is fine too, but you know, how do you move from adopting a set of values to changing behaviours in practice? That's a really good question. Mm. And I, I think mm. I talked about not walking past the litter, Michael, and uh, you know, challenging good, you know, challenging practice that wasn't right, challenging some behaviours that aren't right, mm. um, but also rewarding and recognising good behaviours. I think that appreciative inquiry is mm. really important. Oh, oh, you mean, so that's the way we do things around here. Yes, that's right, that was good, wasn't it? We did we all agree that was good. Great, well, let's do more of that, and perhaps less of that where we didn't quite get it right, but learn from it. Mm. Uh, some of these things are context-specific, but I, 
I do think you know modeling the right behavior is important um, being out there as leaders um, rowing hard uh, when we are all working extremely hard is good listening is important um, and actually trying to um, sometimes behaviors are a blockage to people trying to do things and trying to just help somebody work through a blockage or two so that they can be released to do the thing they want to do and they know is right for patients is, 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 a, is a real good thing and then you can tell stories about those type of occasions uh, as, as, as a senior leader and uh, people like to hear stories they, they sort of work things out through storytelling uh, mm -hmm. without overdoing it and being too anecdotal any mm -hmm. thoughts on that Mike? Um, I, no, I, I agree with very much with what with what you said, and uh, for me, one of the most important things we need to get right is is this issue of positivity. Is is you know when we when we uh, I guess within you know one of the remarkable revolutions within my discipline, in psychology over the last fifteen years, has been our appreciation of just how important positive emotion is to human well-being, to indeed to our longevity, to our mortality. Uh, to our relationships. When we feel positive, we're more creative, we're more cooperative, we're more altruistic, we're more compassionate. And, and so, you know, leaders everywhere modeling um, positivity and, as you say, recognizing people's contributions and valuing their contributions and, and helping be, people be clear about what it is that they're required to do through that. You know, that's a way we do help people to be clear because we say, and that's what we want them to do. Um, but also on the you know the the other side of that that I, I see as problematic in the NHS is very often um, what we see is behavior problems and performance problems are not dealt with. So you know the culture doesn't change because there's still this individual who is rude to other members of staff, who is um, lacks civility towards patients, uh, who frightens people by you know aggressiveness. That's not dealt with, or, or we see situations where people who are not performing well in their role in, in a frontline team and it's not dealt with by the leader because maybe the leader doesn't have the skills of dealing with those performance problems and changing culture is not just about doing the, the, the good stuff of course it's also dealing with that you know let's say three or four percent of people whose behavior is corrosive in the culture and if we don't as well deal with that what we're saying to new people coming into the organization is uh, this is this is okay to behave that way. So it's it's I think dealing with both elements in terms of changing the culture, and that's tough. And that that last point about um, dealing with you know poor performance or poor behaviour, it creates real conflict in teams when you don't when you don't deal with it, doesn't it? Uh, Absolutely. Any top tips on how to handle conflict in teams. You know, there's a positive element of having challenge, mm. but when it is corrosive, any, any sort of two or three top tips on how to deal with conflict in teams, Michael, in your Yeah, well, I, I, absolutely. I mean, I think that, um, you know, we have to recognize that what might be um, a robust discussion for one person in the team is actually very painful to somebody else in the team and they stay awake at night and are very hurt by comments that are made. So um, I think the first step is, is recognizing that there are differences in tolerance of conflict uh, and, and second is, you know, we know generally that high levels of conflict in, in teams are, are just disastrous for team performance. Um, so how to deal with it? Well, one is, first of all, I, I, I think there's a danger sometimes of, of us saying uh, it's down to personalities. We always kind of leap to personalities as the first explanation. But often it's a lack of, in my experience, a lack of clarity of the objectives of the team or lack of clarity about roles in the team. And, some, you know, very often I think when you get those things cleared up and get those things right, the conflict goes away. Um, we, we need to have robust discussions about key, key task issues in teams because we want to provide the best possible care for patients, but that has to be done in a climate of tolerance and mutual respect and mutual affirmation. And I think it's healthy for teams to talk when, there's a, you know, when there is a conflict about you know, how people are feeling about this um, you know, let's let's make let's make it clear if we're starting to feel uncomfortable um, about the way this is going. Um, but but as teams get better, I think at being able to disagree, the level of conflict often goes down because they learn to have disagreements in a mutually supportive way. But if there's somebody 
in the team whose, whose style is causing a lot of conflict continually, then that's a job for the team leader to, to coach that person, to make explicit what the effects of their behavior are on the rest of the team and to set some goals around that person's behavior. So, you know, you come out of a team meeting and you say, well, that, that team meeting was much better. You listened much more than advocated a point of view. You, you took the time to, re to reflect back your understanding of what the other person said, and that enabled you both to have a much more constructive discussion. So that was great. Uh, you know, however, when we went on to talk about the, uh, uh, you know, the rotors, you, you know, your behavior became much more aggressive again and it had the effect of closing people down. So some good, but there's an area, you know, areas you still need to kind of focus on listening. So those sorts of things I think are valuable. I mean, the other thing I would say, Mike, is that sometimes there are people whose behaviors are not modifiable and those behaviors damage team functioning. And if we're in the business of delivering care to patients, then that can be a disaster. So we have to manage the matter teams ultimately. But that's a rare case. And thank you for that mini master class on uh, handling <laughs> conflict. Uh, how are we doing, Michael? We're about just over halfway through. Let's reflex a little. Uh, yeah. Are you okay? Do you want to uh, move it? Do other people listening to the call want to move it on? We're, we're very happy to take uh, other questions. We've got a few questions ourselves. Yeah. Do you want to ask me one, or I can ask you one? What, what do you want to well, I, I've, I've, what, 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 are the, what are the three main worries that keep? Chief execs in the NHS are awake at night. I know that, you know, you're, 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 I know you're, you know, from, from our relationship, I know how much you care about delivering high quality care to the people that you serve. But, you know, what else keeps you awake at night? Um, the, it, uh, are you having an, are you having another cup of tea in the short your, no, your lovely delivered? picture disappearing? Oh. Um, <laughs> but uh, can you still see me? I can still see you, yeah. yeah. You can probably see fine. Joe appearing over my shoulder just trying to get you back. Oh, yeah, if you're coming. Is, is, right, it, hello. is that a, pa hello. Is that hello a package, of, package of uh, shortbread biscuits you delivered Not, No, 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 no biscuits. Oh, okay. um, but uh, I think what keeps me awake at the moment, uh, there are a few things. Um, I think quality and safety for patients and staff at a time of this sort of prolonged austerity, I think it's a new level we've not seen for a while. I think the NHS has been used to you know, having this sort of 5-6% growth trajectory. We may not have seen it all in the front line, but actually I worry about the quality and safety expectations being maintained going forward. That, that, that's one that I think we will is a forever priority and I think it's going to get harder to achieve going forward despite all the research and innovative findings we're making. I think the future of the NHS, I, I worry about it being fragmented, I worry it about being a perhaps a slightly different public sector offer in four or five years time if we're not careful. I think we have a, a you know a major challenge to try and move move forward at a time of austerity when demand is going up. Someone has explained to me, you know, dementia will double in the next, by 2025. It, it, mm. you know, some major diabetes, depression, they're major, major disease burdens that the NHS is going to have to handle. Um, I think sometimes too many initiatives from, from the top. I think the, uh, the temptation for the sort of command control type uh, regime, we want clarity from uh, what, what the NHS mandate is trying to do. Um, I'm trying to drive out 4% savings a year, possibly a little more in some places, but actually it doesn't help me if I, I, I'm not sure whether some of my other services are going to be market tested too. That creates a, a lot of turbulence in, in, uh, and, and uh, you know, I think if you don't know whether some services are going to be retended or they are, then that, that's destabilizing for staff groups who are trying to do a really good job for patients day in, day out. So, you know, I think the quality and safety for patients, I think with Francis coming in, in Mar well, probably February, uh, I think that's going to have some profound things to say about variation in the NHS. The future of the NHS itself and perhaps too many in initiatives that can get in the way of what, what we're trying to do to improve health, save lives and deliver quality 
experience at a time of people most in need? Long answer, but I, you know, I think uh, I, I do worry about things at the moment. Yeah, and, and I guess uh, any recipe, Professor. <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, like you, I, I suppose I worry about you know what's been going on in the NHS over the last two or three years. There's been a lot of uncertainty, as you said, and a lot of um, a lot of change and a lot of initiatives. Well, more than uh, more change than has ever happened in the history of the health service, and so I worry. But I kind of I always come back to this sense of the NHS has something that no other industry sector has. It has in England 1.3 million people who really care about their uh, about the job that they do at a very profound level. They they are in the business of helping other human beings, of helping other people, and giving. And they are just incredibly motivated. And whatever seems to be going on, as it were. You know, at some grand structural level, those frontline people are still going about their daily business of of caring for people and being compassionate. And that's not to minimise, you know, how much the uncertainty has made that more difficult. And that's why I think this whole discussion about creating cultures that are compassionate and focus on high quality care is is so very important. But I I do believe that right across the service and and from the highest levels down to you know the front line levels where it all, all all happens. There are uh, the vast majority of people are committed to finding ways to continue to deliver mm. high quality patient care, and and uh, you know so cleaving to that value of compassion and cleaving to the value of giving and helping others, I think is is critical because that's where the great strength I think of the NHS lies. And you know, as I said, I mean, there are other sectors that have similar kind of orientations, like ed education. But you go into the private sector, and it's damn hard to find anything that even remotely resembles the kind of motivation and commitment that staff in the NHS have. Yeah, interesting. And uh, mm. a couple of observations from uh, people listening into mm. the uh, mm. chat we're having. Uh, uh, Pavel coming back saying, actually, using the competing values frame a framework for looking at culture. Um, has helped people reflect about current culture as well as preferred future yeah. culture. So that, 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 that's interesting in itself. Susie's asking a really good question. So can I ask you it first, Professor Michael West? Go Michael on then. A. West, who's always <laughs> worth reading. Are leaders with values created or born? Yeah. And can you create more empathetic leaders? I think they're really good, good, good points. Yeah, my answer to both of those is a is a very firm yes. Um, leaders, I, th I think leaders, leadership is something that can be learned. I mean, you know, to some extent, there are some people who, you know, are, who are very positive or you know who do have a very warm extrovert type of approach from from the get go. You know, from the moment that they're born. Um, but I I think it's 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 well demonstrated that you can coach those behaviors in people to help them be great leaders and you know leadership's not all about being charismatic and being bouncy it, it's much more about vision and um, helping people clarify their objectives and listening and and, and there's a you know a, a, it's really important that there's a strong element of humility amongst leaders so that they do listen to others so uh, i i believe that i believe that leaders um, Leadership can be learned, just as I believe that empathy can be learned. And, and there's quite a lot of work that um, people like Marty Seligman have done in the States in the positive psychology movement, demonstrating um, people's ability to um, be positive, to be optimistic. And then there's a lot of work around um, emotional intelligence that Daniel Goleman originally initiated, also a meditation researcher back in the 70s, by the way. Mike. <laughs> But Daniel Goldman's work has shown how we can we can nurture empathy and we can nurture that emotional intelligence that's so important to to leadership. And and the and the point about values in leadership is, you know, for me, a big part of that is is helping people get in touch with their values and then just helping them have the confidence to live their values through their leadership. And you know that for me, I, no, I think everybody has pretty much everybody has has values at core, whether it's values of humanity and, um, or, or values of, of justice or values of prudence or whatever, but it, and it's helping people get in touch with those values and you know, there are instruments that can help with that and then giving people the, com the confidence as leaders 
to, to live their values through their leadership. So great question, and, and my answer is a very positive um, uh, and affirming one about the ability of people to be great leaders. Very good. Um, can I ask you another question, and, and, and that's um, a question that is about um, David Nicholson, who, who I worked with back in the 80s, actually, when he was chief executive at Doncaster. What's the message you, you, you keep trying to get across to David Nicholson whenever you meet him that, that, you, you know, that we should try to help you spread also throughout the health service? Um, well, I think as I hope we're evolving and, and the audience is coming in with comments now, but the cult of the NHS, David, Sir David, to you, is, is really important, not just the transactions of which there are so many. So I think the culture of the NHS is really bad. Um, and I think we're at a critical point. Um, I think to, you know, if we fragment the system now, um, I think that could be very dangerous. Um, I'd like to hear Sir David, when he comes back from a, a well-earned bit of leave, talk up some of the positives in the NHS, um, because there are some fantastic things going on. Um, and, and we're going to have some hits in early 2012, um, and, and as we get to grips with the sort of long-term cost reductions and the quality variations that Francis has exposed, and people's role in tackling those variations and avoiding those sorts of variations in the future. Um, so I think, you know, my, my advice, uh, my question is, you know, how do we keep going in times of prolonged austerity? Uh, how do we keep keeping hope, opportunity, a sense of control for people working in the NHS and those patients who receive care from the NHS? Um, there are some of the things that I genuinely do raise uh, with him and his team when I get the chance. Um, I think we're at a critical stage and, and we've got to push on um, uh, and, 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 and make sure that uh, um, yeah, we keep patient experience, staff experience of working in the NHS at the center. They are very, very good measures of quality. The first one of quality now, the second one of quality in maybe five, six months' time. Staff experience has a, has a strong correlation, doesn't it, Michael, yeah. to uh, um, quality going forward? There, there just seems a, um, a, a really powerful link between staff experience and patient experience and there's quite a bit of research just coming out showing how um, when leaders behave with um, briskness or lack of civility that, that that translates down into frontline behavior towards patients and, and other and service users and when leaders you know even at senior levels behave positively and value, you know, value people that that has a permeating effect throughout the organization and that translates into how patients are dealt with. There's some great questions coming in as well. Um, Susie asks about self-interested leaders. You know, what do you do when you've got a leader who's just very self-interested? And Tina asks about commissioners and, and do you worry about the relationship with commissioners and how can we get commissioners to support the kind of processes? I, I thought I'd pick up on the self-interested leader one and um, r rather unfairly back back the commissioner's question over the net to you. <laughs> yeah. um, the self-interested leaders one, I, I think that's very difficult. When you have a leader whose focus is on her or his own advancement rather than the team, it really undermines the team's effectiveness. And you know, it seems to me that leaders throughout the organization have to monitor the leadership of, of people in their organization in order to ensure that the culture is is, is effective, and I, I believe strongly that we need all our leaders to do 360 degree appraisals so we are getting clear feedback uh, for them and for the people who manage them in terms of coaching the behaviors that are necessary so that we expose those leadership behaviors that are primarily self-interested. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult for the team, I think, when you have a leader who is, um, you know, something of a, a tyrant and, or, or, you know, just focused on on their own, just focused on their own advancement. And of course, we're all focused on career development and all of the rest of it. But when it's exclusive, when the leader is exclusively focused in that way, it's damaging. 
What about the commissioner's question, Mike? Right? I think they do have a role to play. Somebody's asking about uh, um, the short tenure of chief execs and senior leaders in place. Yeah, and, yeah, you know, yeah. That's commissioners are one of the, the examples of that where there seems to be probably four changes in the last eight years of how the commissioning system is, is going to work. Commissioners yeah. are important because actually if commissioners are clear about what they want to buy and commission in terms of services, they're actually a lot easier to help. Specialist commissioning I think works quite well in, in some of my experience where perhaps you have a bit of continuity, a relationship around what you're trying to do for patients in terms of volume of course and the cost that, that, that that's um, paid paid um, for, but also the, the, the incentives to get it right, to get the, the experience right. Uh, sequins are important. Uh, these are the commissioning for quality improvement initiatives as are transformation funds. And I think good commissioners will um, give some really uh, strong thought to how they can incentivize system responses between organizations to improve pathways for patients. So if somebody's in uh, high, high expense care for too long, there's actually some thought given to how we can pull people out. Um, much quicker and avoid people getting into the wrong place. People actually don't like to be in hospital um, for any longer than they need to be and we need a few community alternatives. I think commissioners have a, have a great role in helping design the future system, not just uh, maintain the system that keeps the lights on at the moment. So I think commissioning will settle down. I think we'll see stronger national commissioning board uh, specifications, I think uh, there will be clear national standards, I think there will be one national standard for a lot of things and I think there will be a local expression of that by working with GPs and clinicians uh, in, in, in leadership positions in, in, in a local context. I think health and wellbeing boards bring a population perspective too. So yeah, I think commissioning is important. Um, I think it needs to settle down now and I think providers need to take it seriously. Um, and I, I, I like to listen to commissioners. They, they tell me about our services. Uh, they can give an objective view of what's going on across other compare, comparing other, other providers they work with. Um, and I think they can incentivize the right sort of change going forward. They need to have a system perspective, not just an organizational one, which you know, understandably providers like us can get into an organizational perspective from time to time when we're trying to do things for the patients we serve. There's, thanks Mike, that's really, really helpful because it's a, I think it's an area you're really well qualified to comment on and for many people in the health service and, and you know, researchers like me, we often feel quite remote from what's going on in commissioning process. It's really good to hear you know, how, how that can be a positive process and you know, the point about that Stephen raised about CEOs having such short te tenure I think is, is a concern and because it's very difficult to maintain culture um, if you have very short um, tenures. And um, Sally asks about what the effect of private health care is going to be and um, uh, th there's also a question from um, Twitter about, uh, about how you maintain a, a positive culture in an organization that's in a crisis situation. I mean, I had some quick thoughts on that. One is it seems to me that um, it, it's really important to reaffirm what the vision of, is of the organization first in a crisis situation when the organization is going through that, what it stands for. And that's back to this issue of patient care, service user care, high quality, compassion, and so on. Um, but also, I think it's in a crisis situation, it's important that leaders are decisive and decisively deal with the issues that are causing the biggest problems and get some quick wins so that staff can see yes things are changing you know we are seeing that the, that the changes are occurring um, but but you know that core value of delivering high quality care is being reinforced rather than undermined but I'll, and also it's going back to what we've talked about a number of times already about involving um, staff in, in defining the problems and, and finding the solutions but, um, you know, and I suppose, I suppose the value of that is it gives people the sense that they are in control because they're being listened to. And we know that, as you said at the very beginning, that people do need to feel in control 
in times of, of huge change, in times of crisis. So it's giving people that sense of um, direction and control. And um, maybe if you have a comment on that, right, and we, uh, we could come back to the point about private health care in a moment. Yeah, I think, um, I think pluralistic ideas are good. You know, other ideas from other sectors uh, yeah. are a good thing because I think if we just do more of the same, in the same old way in the NHS, we're going to run out of money. So for me, we've got to try some new things. Mm -hmm. um, we've got to try things that work uh, more consistently. And we've got to learn about the things that really work well and get our staff doing the stuff that works faster and diffusing that. So mm -hmm. I think there's um, a whole range of things there. I, I think the private sector in the mix can add sharpness. I think they can bring innovation, uh, as can public sector. I, I've never been short of uh, ideas from my own organizations that I've run. Um, but staff tend to have the ideas, not, not people like uh, chief execs. And I think they need the opportunity to explore those ideas, test them out, uh, and try and implement them. Um, but I think we need, we need more chance to innovate um, without having those sort of crushing targets that can a stifle innovation, and, and, and yeah. that, that I think has been a bit of a feature, perhaps of the acute sector more recently, but uh, uh, it, it's something that if we have the wrong targets, it can be very stifling. Yeah, and certainly, you know, I, going around different NHS organisations across England, and indeed in Scotland and Northern Ireland and in Wales, there are so many good practices. You know, the answers are out there. People, people are coming up with ideas for doing things more effectively, more efficiently, and delivering higher quality care. Um, we need to learn from each other. There needs to be a lot more looking outside our own organization for answers, because they're out there. And as you say, going out to the private sector, you know, one of the medical directors we have been talking to has been going into the nuclear industry to learn about, about safety issues. And you know, that, that seems exactly the right thing to do. Um, and, and in terms of the private sector coming in, I think the, um, it, it, is a, it is a difficult transition when there starts to be more competition from the private sector. And I think that needs to be monitored very carefully because some of the indications we're picking up is uh, that where there is more competition, that that may have a negative impact on staff experience. If, if the leadership are uh, become too fixated on issues of productivity and cost effectiveness and so on, Maybe we should kind of summarize, Mike, you know, last points we want to make, because I see our time is running out, sadly. It's been a great well, conversation. Uh, Michael, it, it's been great to talk to you and listen to you. I hope uh, our, our listeners have enjoyed the experience, too, and I'm sure we can continue various interactions by email or, or, or others. You know where I am. But I, I think, for me, it is about um, getting it right for patients you know, focusing on what patients want. The first four things I look at in terms of how my organization is going is service user and patient experience, staff satisfaction, supervision rates, and appraisal rates. Sickness absence probably pretty quick after that. But they're the type of things I look at. And I think that tells me a bit of a story when those things aren't quite right there's a second level of sort of inquiry that comes to mind. Uh, the culture of organizations is um, what you deserve as a leader sometimes. And I think um, being uh, paying attention to it, modeling the right behaviors, showing situational leadership is really important. And the NHS needs that now. And uh, I know uh, you feel that too, Michael. But I'll leave the last word to you, Professor <laughs> Michael A. West. <laughs> Great to talk to you, Mike, as ever. It's a, it's a pleasure, and I've really enjoyed the conversation. I want to um, end. I've been reflecting on how much I keep hearing the word compassion being used. It's been very much around in the NHS sphere on Twitter today. Jeremy Hunt was using it last week uh, at the King's Fund. And, and I'm hearing that word more and more. And, uh, and that's incredibly encouraging in terms of the importance of creating a culture of compassion. And my understanding of that word is it means that we, uh, we, we feel with the other person that we're engaged with, but we don't just kind of wallow in the feeling. Actually, we start to think about how we can make a difference to that person 
and then we take action and that, that compassion is that feeling for and with that, but the determination and the desire and the intent to help and that seems to me to be pervading more and more the discourse around what the NHS stands for uh, today. So despite all of the changes, I see this very positive culture change uh, going on. And I think it's exactly where, where uh, the, the conversation needs to go. And so I'm really encouraged and reassured by that. And encouraged and reassured by the fact that I meet so many people in the NHS who are so compassionate and positive, And I meet so many great leaders like you who are really determined to make a difference. Thank you. Good and night. To, Have a good thanks evening. Thanks to everybody for joining us to, uh, this afternoon too. Thank you. Good night. Good night.